evening and welcome. I'm Emily Ponchel, Public Programs Manager here at the Newberry. Thank you for joining us for this evening's program, Slavery and Emancipation in the Age of Revolutions. The Newberry Library supports and inspires research, teaching, and learning in the humanities. Since our founding in 1887, the Newberry has remained dedicated to deepening our collective understanding of ourselves and the world around us. We connect researchers and visitors with our collection in the Newberry's reading rooms, exhibition galleries, program spaces, classrooms, and online digital resources. The Newberry reading rooms and exhibition galleries are open to readers at no charge with no appointment necessary Tuesday through Saturday. Please visit our website at newberry.org to learn more about our collections and exhibitions, digital resources, online classes, and free public programs like this one. If you would like to help keep our reading rooms, exhibitions, and public programs free and open to all, you will also find a link there to make a donation. Today's event is part of a larger project, Viva la Libertad, Forming More Perfect Unions Across the Americas, is a series of free public programs that have taken place since last spring. These events bring together scholars, writers, artists, and community members to explore independent struggles across the Americas in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and to reflect on their legacies today. Looking back on the age of revolutions 200 years ago in Latin America and the United States, Viva la Libertad examines how new countries emerged from colonial rule, who gained freedom, and who was left behind, and why so many are still fighting for liberty, racial justice, and democracy. The project has been made possible in part by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. During tonight's program, if you have any questions, you can text them at any time to 833-899-3399. And don't worry about uh, writing it down. We've placed the number on each slide of the presentation. So anytime you have a question or a thought, you can just type in and send us your question. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Will Hansen, Director of Reader Services and Curator of Americana. Will? Thank you, Emily. Uh, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, I am honored to introduce the three speakers we have with us tonight, uh, Cherno Cisse Jr., Marcela Echeverri, and Celso Castillo. Uh, first, uh, Cherno Cisse Jr. is Associate Professor of Religious Studies at DePaul University. He holds a PhD from Northwestern University and is a historian of the Black Atlantic and of colonial North American and antebellum United States history, whose research focuses on the intersection of religion, black political thought, identity, and community formation. He is currently completing a book manuscript entitled Black Boston, and the making of African-American Freemasonry, leadership, religion, and community in early America. He is also exploring how different forms of 19th and 20th century African-American historicism were comprised of aligned and competing theological and secular concerns. Next will be Marcella Echeverri. She is assistant professor of history at Yale University. She received her PhD in Latin American and Caribbean history from New York University and taught at the City University of New York before joining Yale in 2013. She has written about anthropology, gender, and nationalism in mid 20th century Colombia, slavery and law in the Spanish Empire, and the history of Indian and black royalists in Latin America's independence wars. Her research and teaching interests focus on the relationship between politi political subjectivities and social transformation in Latin America from colonial times to the present. She is at work on a book-length research project focused on slavery and anti-slavery in the Gran Colombia between 1820 and 1860. Last but not least is Celso Castillo. He is Associate Professor of History at Vanderbilt University. 
He holds a PhD from UC Berkeley. His first book, Slave Emancipation and Transformations in Brazilian Citizenship from the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2016, received three prizes, including the 2018 Bolton Johnson Prize from the Conference of Latin American History for best book in the field of Latin American history. He is currently at work on two book-length monographs that broaden the scope of the cultural and intellectual histories of slavery and Afro-Latin America. Interestingly, to me at least, he is also interested in bridging conversations between Latin American and Latinx studies, developing a project on soccer, the Spanish language media in the US, and the 1994 World Cup. With that, I will ask you to welcome our speakers and turn it over to Cherno. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, thank you for everybody who's here. And a thank you to the Newberry for inviting me to be a part of this very esteemed panel. So let's see here. OK, first off, you'll have to forgive me. I think I forgot an N in there. Um, so I apologize for that. Uh, as, I, as I begin my remarks, I, I want to start broadly and uh, then narrow to uh, some particular examples. And, and hopefully my beginning will provide a broad basis uh, for um, the wonderful things that my colleagues will have to say. And so I think it's important to remember that the transatlantic slave trade uh, begins in the late 15th century, and that the American colonies, North American colonies, develop as a direct consequence of the expansion of the transatlantic slave trade. And so this is really important because we have to remember that the transatlantic slave trade begins almost 300 years before the American Revolution. Okay? And so even though I'm going first in this panel, when we think about certain chronology, the chronology of certain revolutions beginning with the American Revolution, um, in many ways, we can frame histories of various independence studies in the Americas beginning much earlier than with the American Revolution. So I think this is a really important point. I'm going first in kind of a chronology, chronology of revolutions. But in terms of a larger framework, when we're thinking about kind of the transatlantic slave trade, um, there are many other ways in which we could have probably reformulated um, the order of this panel if we'd wanted to. And so uh, I also, in thinking expansively, uh, want to emphasize two very important demographic points before I, I narrow down. And the first is that between the 16th and 18th centuries, Africans comprised approximately four of every five arrivals to the Americas. Four of every five uh, arrivals. And that's a statistic that not a lot of people, I think, recognize because we tend to think about um, Europeans as people who are holding power. And so we think about the people who've arrived to these places somehow as being kind of the historical or demographic majority. The second thing is that the total number of Africans brought to the Americas from the 16th to the 19th century, uh, that, that, of, that in this period approximately 40% were taken to what is today Brazil and about 10% to what would become the United States. So again, we see uh, that demography matters, okay? And so despite history being recorded and written by those in power, these statistics remind us that Africans played crucial but often overlooked roles in the development of new economic systems, the rise of new moral and political ideas, and the creation of new cultures in the Americas. These statistics also begin to demonstrate the role of slavery and race in capitalism, nation formation, and cultural transformation. And so, uh, again, kind of moving from the broad to the narrow, so that's, that's broad historical context, both in terms of space and time, uh, a little bit about um, notions. 
so a brief discussion about uh, slavery and then race. It's certainly the case that various forms of human bondage existed in the Mediterranean world, West Africa, and the Americas prior to the 15th century arrival of Europeans to the Americas. However, African and indigenous systems of human labor and enslavement were very different from the kind of slavery that developed in the Americas. Although slavery has been practiced throughout human history, the transatlantic slave trade redefined slavery. It racialized slavery. The status of being free became something applied to people of European descent, and the status of being enslaved or owned uh, became a condition applied to people of African descent. And so that's a bit about slavery, a bit about race. Uh, and I don't want to be reductive, but for the sake of conversation, I want to highlight two ways of thinking about race, what I call kind of the expansive understanding of race and a narrower version of race. The more expansive version of race understands race as a form of othering, a way of describing a person or a group uh, to create kind of a fundamental difference between me and them. And this expansive notion of race, some scholars apply throughout history. It's a form of othering. There are other scholars who argue that this idea of race is a very modern idea, a very modern category. And in fact, that it's a category that arises out of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, and that it has to do with, obviously, the enslavement of people of African descent. But it also has to do with the intersection of physical appearance, legal condition, cultural and moral ideas. So it's not just reducible to what somebody looks like, but that it emerges historically out of the transatlantic slave trade. And so this, in some ways, highlights uh, this kind of broad uh, scope that uh, I've used to introduce my material. And so having laid out this kind of broad historical context and talked briefly about some key terms, I want to move to individuals. And so this is somebody that uh, some of you might be familiar with, uh, Phyllis Wheatley. She is uh, brought to uh, North America uh, by the, the Wheatley family aboard the ship Phyllis in 1761. She's brought as a very young person from uh, West Africa. And uh, ironically, um, even though she's enslaved in Boston, this is a place that understood its enslaved population as kind of status symbols. So if you owned a slave, uh, or if you enslaved somebody, it, it demonstrated that you had the resources to do so. So Wheatley was able to gain uh, an education that matched or was better than that uh, 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 that most white males received in the late 18th century in North America. And she uses this to great advantage. She travels to England in 1773 with the son of the uh, Wheatley family in order to publicize this book of poetry uh, that she writes. Uh, this book of poetry is published in 1773, and it becomes, in fact, the first uh, book of published poetry uh, from a person of African descent in the, uh, in the Atlantic world. And an interesting thing happens, according to Wheatley's biographer, while she's in Great, Great Britain and in London. And so in 1772, the year before Wheatley arrived to uh, London, uh, Great Britain ended slavery on its soil. Now, that's a very interesting story that I, I won't get into right now. But Wheatley knows this. And so her biographer argues that when she arrives to uh, Great Britain, she argues that she will not go back to North America unless she is granted her freedom on what was then free soil. So Wheatley goes to England as an English subject, and then she's able, as an enslaved English subject, and she's able to return to the colonies before the, the Revolutionary War as uh, a free colonial American. And so this is one of her more famous poems that I have up on the board. 
And it's very interesting because in the 1960s and 70s, scholars essentially dismissed this poem. They thought that it had nothing of use for African-American thought. They thought this was an example of a black individual who had simply been kind of co-opted by Christianity. And more recently, scholars have really tried to give Phyllis Wheatley her due. They've recognized how crucial she was to debates about slavery and race in the late 18th century. And they argue that she's being quite sarcastic in this poem. They argue that she's taking the ideas uh, and the metaphors of Christianity and she's essentially reversing them to make the argument for the equality of all people of African descent and to make a very powerful critique of slavery. And scholars also argue that Wheatley recognizes this. And so uh, even though, you know, uh, we, we might understand Wheatley somehow as uh, a nominal figure, she is very much um, a very important pivotal figure for debates about how people understood slavery and people of African descent. Wheatley was a woman. She, and she dies in 1784. So she dies just after the American Revolution. Uh, she dies as, as a, a, a person of, uh, of America. And uh, she never takes up arms, but nonetheless, we have examples of other African Americans during the revolutionary era who, uh, by way of their movement, um, also present uh, critiques to these ideas of inferiority and of slavery, even if they do it very differently than how Wheatley did it. And so here we have um, some text from Lord Dunmore's proclamation and again, this is before you have the formal war, but nonetheless, you have uh, the English trying to use enslaved people um, as a way to create uh, 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 a way of using the enslaved population um, in this growing colonial crisis. Uh, and this is really important because it leads to um, some other uh, current understandings of the American Revolution uh, that seek to situate the beliefs and the actions of people of African descent in the middle of the revolution rather than seeing them as um, uh, ancillary to what was going on. And so in fact, um, recent scholarship has argued, or recent scholarship has, in surveying the newspapers, found that there's this fear of the ins of, of insurrection of both free and enslaved uh, black people. And that the colonists try to use this in some ways as a way of critiquing uh, 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 British power. And so the argument essentially is that a fear of revolt on the part of the enslaved is part of this process that actually allowed the 13 colonies to cohere against Great Britain. And I think that's a very powerful argument because it puts race at the center of the formation of this new nation rather than understanding race as something that's somehow um, on the periphery of the formation of this new nation. In addition to uh, those enslaved people in Virginia, uh, some of whom who went to uh, the British, you had other African Americans uh, at New York, uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, uh, who fought both um, in local and actual units of uh, the military. And so yet again, you have African Americans constantly inserting themselves into these new historical debates about ending slavery and about the equality of black people. And so moving forward, it would be easy to argue that, you know, as a consequence of the American Revolution, some black people 
are free. They gain, they gain their freedom. But even here, I think we have to be careful. Um, this image that you see behind me was a famous image popularized in the late 18th century. And, and it was used to great effect. It creates sympathy for enslaved people. But it also positions an enslaved person um, in a position of deference. So one way to kind of read this against the grain is to think about this in contrast to those enslaved people who actually, in fact, took up arms. Rather than just asking for freedom, they, in fact, uh, demanded it in a very active fashion. And so here again, when we think about uh, the revolution, and I'm kind of moving and thinking a bit about its paradoxes, uh, this is an example uh, of a membership certificate from the American Colonization Society. And so again, even though we have a new nation that's formed on the premises that all people are theoretically free, um, one of the uh, ironic paradoxical results is that citizenship is not granted to everybody. But again, this doesn't mean that African Americans sit idly by and accept this. In various ways, they try to balance, negotiate between local, regional, and even national laws to establish themselves as citizens in various legal and uh, political contexts in the Americas. And so this then brings me back to kind of where I began uh, in this talk. And it's thinking about this broader framework of the transatlantic slave trade. And here we have Omar Ibn Said. And so you might think, well, what does he have to do with the American Revolution? And so there's an interesting comparative comment that I want to make here. Uh, so he's born uh, in uh, West Africa, um, probably somewhere along the um, Senegal River. And he's actually captured. So you have the expansion of these um, Islamic states um, in upper West Africa, sub-Saharan West Africa. And he's captured as a prisoner of war. And so it's as a consequence of revolutions in West Africa that he actually winds up in the United States. And so I think this is interesting when we think about uh, the American Revolution. It's not the only revolution that's ever happening. And even though our focus here is in the Americas, I think it's always important to maintain a kind of global perspective. And even though Omar Ibn Said never uh, gains his freedom. He, in fact, dies during uh, the Civil War. For me, he becomes another interesting example of the paradoxes of revolution, but also this broader context. Um, he dies never having gotten his freedom, but at the same time, when we think about his struggles to maintain his Islamic identity, this opens up new avenues to think about various forms of resistance, in addition to Wheatley, who is reframing Christianity, and all of those African Americans who ran away or made decisions about whether to fight with the Patriots or whether to fight with the British in terms of how best to secure their freedom. And that's it. Thank you. So I'm next, and I want to begin by uh, thanking the Newberry Library for inviting me to be here. It's really a great pleasure to be back at the library and also to be back in Chicago. Uh, it's also an honor to be part of this panel and uh, especially to be a part of such an important conversation that places slavery and emancipation in a hemispheric perspective. And in uh, the framing remarks that I will, uh, am I moving too much around the, the, the okay. Um, I, I want to touch on three broad points. Uh, the first one is the relationship between uh, the age of revolutions and abolition in Latin America. Okay, so we are going to start moving as, as this is a, you know, we're trying to put together a hemisphere in, in three in three acts, uh, and we're going to start moving toward the region called Latin America. And of course, as you know, Latin America encompasses 
one one very broad region uh, of Spanish uh, that followed Spanish colonization, and then the other one uh, Portuguese. So I will be mainly focusing on the Spanish um, Americas. I also want to talk about the particularities of slavery and freedom in Latin America, framing them in an Atlantic context. And finally, I will, of course, zoom into the topic of, uh, of our uh, discussion, which is the anti-slavery republics in a hemispheric perspective. So to begin, uh, interestingly, we, we are using, an, uh, I'm using another one of the maps of the, of the uh, Slave Voyages database, which is a wonderful uh, resource for those of you who, who don't know it. Uh, this is the, the way to access it. It has more maps and incredible data upon which the, the maps are based uh, for you to explore the history of the transatlantic uh, slave trade. Now, I, cho I did choose a map that doesn't have, uh, I mean, the one you, you had has some of the um, inter-American trade that is also very important for understanding uh, the arrival of um, African captives to precisely Spanish America. But here, the reason why I wanted to get started with this is to think about really what is the proportion, and it really demographically, the map makes a very big point visually, of African captives that are being taken to the region that we know as uh, Latin America, which is really significant. Um, it's it, in proportion, two thirds or, or more of these uh, populations are going to end up in the territories, that, again, either of the, of the Portuguese or Spanish um, empires. And um, so, again, though here we don't see the, the internal uh, slave trades, it's important to think about uh, the British and Dutch Caribbean being hubs for the transportation of enslaved uh, Africans into the Spanish um, American, uh, basically South America. Well, this map is really showing us uh, the geography of slavery, and, and by thinking about it so expansively, undoubtedly we're thinking about slavery as a, an institution that, that was quite diverse, and I want to emphasize that, di that diversity. At the same time, I think it's important to think about this space as really highly connected, right? So the history of slavery in the Atlantic world, the world that existed and was created uh, within this Atlantic, the, the two shores of the Atlantic Ocean, really was rich in connections, of course, through people, as we've already heard uh, some examples, also through the institution of slavery itself, and importantly, through ideas about slavery and about eventually its abolition. I want us to think about Latin America framed in this very connected, um, context. Uh, so chronologically, um, I just laid out a, a few kind of moments that I think are important to think about uh, the history of slavery and again of abolition in the American uh, hemisphere, right? Because um, as, as I think uh, Professor Cisse already said, and it's, I, I want to kind of uh, follow up on that point, it is the Iberian empires that have the longest chronological record of being involved in the slave trade when we think about the earliest moment, the 15th century, and the last voyage that has been documented, which actually has also been by uh, an Iberian ship. And so this is important to consider the fact that it is really the longest presence of Africans arriving into the Americas. And therefore, if we go back to the map that we, we have shown you before, the two maps, we can see the significance of Latin America for the history of slavery, and conversely, the significance of the African diaspora for the history of Latin America, right? These two things are completely linked and uh, important to, to consider. 
There are some particularities of the history of slavery that also will explain particularities in the history of abolition, and that's partly what I wanted to, to get to with this, um, this second point. It has to do, for example, with the really close connection between uh, the slavery, Iberian slavery and Roman codes that actually made manumission one very important uh, strategy for enslaved people who wanted to um, access freedom. Some of this actually happened, in fact, uh, through self-purchase, as, as I'll be talking about next as well. But importantly, what this means is that the population of free people of African descent in the, in the Latin American region that we know uh, Latin America today was increasing, growing, and really demographically significant, which speaks of the depth of these uh, kind of avenues for freedom for people who had been enslaved. We generally think of this chronology quite differently, as you were suggesting, and, and we generally tend to think that it was British or either British or French involvement that really predominated in this, in this uh, history of slavery. But that's why it's important to understand that the Iberian empires are um, really quite significant, historically speaking. In the 19th century, and, and this is really the, the, the turning point that we also know as the Age of Revolutions, um, the Haitian Revolution is going to create a break that affects all the regions across the Atlantic world. So this is another point that I, I will stress when I go deeper into the history of abolition in, in, in Latin America. But I wanted to put it here so that we take into account once again those connections how the history of uh, slavery is transforming, perhaps through the reverberations of one single event, like the Haitian Revolution, that is going to really create a mark in, in the way that people think about slavery and, and its future. So, just looking, at, I'm not sure that I can point to this, but looking at the two last points here, I want to highlight a very brief chronology of, of the beginning of abolition that would have to do with the early gradual abolitions of the U.S. North, right, in the 1780s. Then we would have, uh, let, let's call it like a step uh, in the 1820s through 50s that have to do specifically with the abolitions of the Spanish-American republics. Then follow the British emancipation of the 1830s, right, and then we have the other really better known late abolitions that take place in the latter part of the 19th century in the United States, Cuba, and Brazil. So again, I think it's important to take into account that this is a progression, but it's also uh, moments that are connected very, very um, actively. The other point to keep into account is that although we know the 19th century generally as the history of uh, abolition, the moment of abolition, it really is when you think about it from the point of view of Brazil, Cuba, and the United States, the moment of the height of, of uh, slave plantations and the slave economy, right? So really the 19th century is a much more complex moment uh, than, than sometimes we think when, when, we, when we look at it from the point of view only of the history of the end of slavery. So going into this question of when, when do we really see the beginning, if we, if we were going to talk about in those terms of, of, of ideas of freedom or practices that are uh, bringing people of uh, African descent who were enslaved in, 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 the, in the path toward freedom. In particular, here I'm referring to the, the Latin American context. And what I wanted to, to point out, I already mentioned the question of manumission and how it's linked, obviously, to, to these Roman codes, is that enslaved people are actively searching for avenues to get, uh, you know, to be freed. It could be through negotiating manumission that would be granted by, by the, uh, the owner. But it could also be through self-purchase, very important, because in some regions or, or most regions of Latin America, the enslaved were able to work for themselves 
one day a week and then have some sort of savings to reach a point where they could be uh, purchasing themselves or their or their or members of their families. There's also the avenue of flight, which we already heard about as well, and it has to do with an important um, source for the creation of maroon communities or communities of uh, people who have escaped slavery and that eventually are going to become towns of uh, free uh, people of African descent. So, so all of these are different avenues that coexisted. They preceded, in many ways, abolition. And they also then, after the abolition of slavery is going to start, uh, they're, they're going to continue and sometimes incentivize. So really, emancipation and abolition are going to be more characteristic of this age of revolutions that we're talking about here. And here is where I want to get to the specifics of how this is going to happen across Spanish America. This table shows you that there are really many dates that we could consider relevant in this, in this process, right? Uh, it shows us that, that uh, if we wanna, it's like a contested issue, really, where we would begin or where we would put really the, the, the specific point where uh, abolition starts or even ends. Uh, but what is crucial to think about is, in terms of the age of revolutions, historians have been really rethinking what happened in Latin America during the independence wars. And one of the elements that has become clearly relevant to think about revolution in Latin America in the 19th century is precisely the abolition of slavery, right? Much like I said before, the, hey, and, and we know in, in, as, a, as a consequence of the American Revolution, slavery also begins to be destabilized, much like the Haitian Revolution obviously breaks completely the institution of slavery uh, on that island, then we have a similar phenomenon in the, in the continent with the beginning of the independence wars against Spain that start around 1809 and 1810. From that moment on, uh, there's going to be multiple factors that are going to come together and uh, that is what we would call the abolition process. There, this, this process is actually quite connected with Haiti as well. I, I want to, to go back to that point because it's in many ways in the minds of the slave owners or, or the government officials, there was a lot of fear about Haiti reproducing itself on the mainland, right? Like having real slave rebellions that could lead uh, to emancipation. And so it's either that fear one of the sources in which Haiti uh, affects the minds of many of these um, uh, government officials, or through the alliance that actually takes place between one of the leaders of the Spanish-American independence war, Simón Bolívar, uh, and the president of Haiti, Petion, Alexander Petion, this alliance between the president of Haiti and the the uh, Spanish-American quote-unquote liberator is another turning point that shows us how important the connection between Spanish America and the Haitian Revolution is going to be when it comes to these uh, anti-slavery um, revolutionary movements. But it's not only Colombia, actually, that is going to have this type of impulse toward uh, instituting anti-slavery laws. Everywhere across the continent, in, in the Spanish-American independence movements, there's going to be laws against the slave trade. That's why we have one column here that is specifically about the slave trade, because this is one of the earliest laws that are going to be instituted. And you also have another important layer of the abolition process is the free womb laws, also modeled in many ways or in dialogue with the free womb laws that had been earlier um, instituted in the U.S. North. So while these very important legal steps are being taken, we have to take into account one of the most important factors, which is the mobilization of people of African descent in the armies, which is very much what we heard also for the United States, right? Without this mobilization of people of African descent in the armies, both for, against independence, this would not have become such a crucial point 
of debate and of actually uh, action with regards to thinking about how to end slavery. So we know these processes as actually gradual abolition processes, meaning that they are not automatic emancipation like we, we would have seen in the, in the Haitian Revolution, or eventually we would see in the 1830s in the, in the British Caribbean, but they're envisioned to take place um, through the decades, obviously by stopping the, the arrival of, of Africans, by freeing every child that is born from an enslaved mother, and creating other types of institutions like uh, manumission juntas that would allow for freeing you know, different uh, slaves at different uh, ceremonies that were also symbolic, very, very important for this abolition process. So wrapping up, I want to just talk about the importance of abolition in shaping really this political discourse of the Spanish American republics, right? The, the Spanish American republics are going to emerge committed to ending slavery and to granting rights to people of African descent. Um, and, and, and this would be to include them as citizens. There's very interesting research actually on the idea of racial harmony that accompanied the creation of these Spanish American republics, which implied really, as I said before, including people of African descent into these, into these nations. But it's obvious, and, and we know this, that this was a process that was not fully realized, in part because uh, abolition itself was not a linear process, as we already heard, anywhere in the Atlantic world. There were very powerful interests that made the process quite erratic and slow. It actually took, as you can see here, around 30 to 40 years for the final abolitions to, act, to, to come in many of these countries. So we have to think of this as very slow processes in which, of course, people of African descent are going to be engaged either militarily, as I said before, or through the law as well. Uh, the last thing, because I'm, I'm not sure about the time, I, I lost track here with my iPhone, but I'm, I'm imagining I should start wrapping up for real, uh, that I wanted to say, and it's very interesting, I don't know if you saw this, uh, Professor Sisay, that I have this image here, which is, it was made in, in it's, a, it's actually a, a, a sculpture that was made in honor of Simon Bolivar, the, the liberator, quote unquote, that I mentioned before, had made this alliance with uh, Alexander Petun from Haiti, and who is remembered and recognized in Colombia as one of the agents of the abolition of slavery, because he is obviously one of the people who made sure that the gradual abolition laws were uh, written in the Constitution of Colombia. Interestingly, the image is reproducing what you just pointed out to us before, the idea of the enslaved as, as completely passive in the process, which is wrong. I'm, I'm really glad you pointed that out because there, had, there would have not been any of this really radical turn toward abolition if it had not been for the participation of people of African descent in the independence wars themselves. But what is interesting is that while they're using a very similar image, I mean like literally almost copying the same image of for the man, they're also adding the woman and the child, both of whom are really central for these processes of abolition, as I, as I mentioned before, in part because of the free womb laws that are you know, one of the mechanisms that characterize the gradual abolition processes in, in Spanish America. So to, to conclude, I wanna say that abolition, we have to see it as a tool of state formation because it's central to the process of independence and of, of, of uh, anti-colonial state formation. It becomes a tool also that legitimizes these Republican discourses. And it, this is a legitimation that takes place on one hand in the international arena, right? Because as we know, abolition is, is becoming more and more important everywhere in the Atlantic world. But it's also crucially important for the enslaved themselves that are either being 
um, drawn to, to these republics as citizens or as soldiers in the wars. Uh, what we're going to see next, and I'm going to obviously turn now uh, to give the word to my colleague, uh, Professor Castillo, is that in the Americas, we're going to start finding very different racial and citizenship regimes based on the different avenues toward abolition, right? So when we talk about these different moments, these different places, we're also kind of giving shape to a map of race relations that are going to be uh, triggered or, or constructed based on these different avenues toward abolition. So I will leave it there and I will pass, I, I think this is a good idea to pass it to Professor Castillo as well and uh, we'll then turn to uh, Brazil, the other side of, of Latin America that I haven't covered. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Very excited to participate in this program, to be in Chicago as well. I want to begin by acknowledging the public um, for your participation, your engagement. Um, and certainly the team here at the Newberry, Emily, Will, Karen, Catherine, thank you so much for uh, undertaking this long-term project uh, that started over a couple of years ago in collaboration and funding with the NEH. So um, hats off for, for pulling this off, and I know that it's almost coming to fruition. Um, and certainly my fellow panelists, it's always a treat and a pleasure to engage in these broad and comparative conversations. So I want to just begin by pointing out that the one of the underlying themes of my presentation about how slavery ended in Brazil is really also a reflection on kind of past and present on questions about uh, past and present on questions about historical memory, politics, and how and how history is written. Um, and the the Treze de Maio, May thirteenth, um, is itself a very uh, known loaded and debated date uh, in the context of Brazilian historical and public discussion um, and its relative place vis-a-vis uh, -vis questions about citizenship and black politics in particular has interestingly changed uh, a, a good amount in the last generation or so and that's where I'm gonna end up so uh, so as a broad overview, I just wanted to start um, placing us more or less in the context of Brazil, let's say uh, circa 1860. Um, and I, I do want to kind of just parenthetically point to this brand new book that came out called Boundaries of Freedom that really uh, synthesizes the best uh, of the scholarship that is coming out, particularly from the Brazilian Academy um, on these questions of slavery and emancipation over the last 20 to 30 years. And it was co-edited by actually a colleague of ours at the University of Chicago, uh, Broadwin Fisher and Kayla Greenberg at the University of Pittsburgh. Anyway, so to kind of pivot back to where this story begins, it's important to kind of establish that slavery was largely intact around, let's say, 1860, right? And, and, and to go ahead and give it away, it was abolished, as has already been mentioned, in 1888, right? So if we sort of start like, the it's not really a countdown of the beginning to the end, but it's to kind of understand the specific conjunctures and contingent elements that signaled important changes in the ways that the state, in the way that the economy, and in the way that people thought about the relationship between slavery and nation. Um, around 1860, two out of Brazil's 10 million, two million out of Brazil's 10 million people, more or less, were enslaved. Okay, which is a higher number than had ever been enslaved in Brazil previously. Um, and it's important to note that of those two million, about one million had been brought to Brazil over the last 40 years. Right, so it's an African population. Um, that, that, that is present. That, that's also very important. And African in, in, in its 
variety of ethnicities and cultures and, and, and experiences, right? So that, that's an important kind of context. And furthermore, um, of those one million that had been taken to Brazil in the last 40 years, about 75% had been taken in what is called the illegal slave trade, right? So there had been international, there had been laws to seemingly abolish it that were completely overlooked and part of the deliberate ways that the Brazilian state designed its economic and political structures, right? So it's not by accident that over 700,000 people enter a country over a 20 year period, right? So that's, that's just important to kind of establish that the illegal slave trade, the slave trade, as, as has been mentioned, were critical to state making in Brazil um, in, in its early history. And to the last kind of point of reference, I will say that there was an important citizenship construct in Brazil based in part of the lessons, quote unquote, of other um, upheavals in, in, in other slave uh, areas in the Americas whereby legally at least, for the most part, um, race wasn't articulated as a main way to differentiate um, political rights for men, right? So I think this is important to kind of understand that like it, it isn't a legally segregated system and, 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 and there aren't, and if two million people were enslaved, about close to four million people were uh, free people of African descent, of which a sizable number achieved great prominence across the spectrum, from the foremost literary writers of the 19th century to in a case or two of, uh, of a prime minister even, um, who was, had African, some African descent, right, um, engineers, doctors, lawyers, so forth and so on. So I think it's important to kind of present that context as a launch for when we start to interrogate more closely some of the events that led to a shift in the thinking about the relationship between slavery and nation building in Brazil. And two of those uh, shifts that happened in the 1860s were continental in scope, right? One being the U.S. Civil War. And I'm just going to point to one really specific way in which the Civil War changed the equation for the thinking about slavery in Brazil. The Union's um, um, win or the, the Union's victory um, forced the Brazilian emperor at the time, it's a constitutional monarchy, to essentially set in motion a process to start to design a gradual abolition plan. So it there became understood that it is not tenable politically to maintain a slave system as a result of what happened here, right? It's also interesting to know that white swaths of the Brazilian population uh, received information about and in some cases acted on news of the Union victory. Um, there's been some excellent recent research on slave conspiracies in northern Brazil uh, where there was this understanding that the U.S. Is, the Union's victory was going to signal the end of slavery in, in Brazil as well. Um, there's another kind of curious connection between the Civil War and Brazil whereby six to 10,000 people from slave owners from the south fled to Brazil to kind of prolong and, 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 and live out a particular way of living in a Brazilian context, right? So those are just kind of two specific connections that we can return to in Q&A and, and, and are just part of the, the, the ways these two stories unfolded. The other m major event that catalyzed a significant change of thinking about slavery in Brazil was uh, more South American in, in nature, and this was a war that broke out in southern South America. It's called the Paraguayan War, and it lasted six years from 1864 to 1870. And one reason why the decision to set in motion a gradual abolition plan as soon as the, the tide had turned in the US Civil War um, took almost seven years to come to fruition in Brazil was because of the outbreak of this war. 
And militarily, it's kind of neither here nor there in this context about why it took Brazil so long to seemingly uh, overrun a, a country as small as Paraguay. Um, but what was important is that the recruitment, the mobilization, those efforts during the war really raised the question of who's fighting for us? Who are we? Right? And, and, that inter and the international press also played a huge role in starting to criticize Brazil for seemingly sending its enslaved to fight the war. Right? And so the Paraguayan War became this important context, kind of like the American Revolution, and, and as Professor Echeverri was also mentioning in terms of the wars of independence, in which to kind of rethink the, the, the questions about um, nation and the state and, and questions about belonging vis-a-vis -vis slavery. Um, so here I'm just going to turn to this question of the relationship between slave resistance and mass mobilizations. So in Brazil you did have an extended period of, you know, 20 some years of where we can think about national mass mobilizations. Of course there were ebbs and flows and, 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 and they had their own kind of local registers and, and, and dynamics, but nonetheless, um, historians have recognized the importance of such existence. And, you know, it was long debated, this question, somewhat artificially in terms of, well, who were the ones behind abolition? Was it the abolitionists or was it the enslaved? And when you study it, you see the intersections between the two really clearly. This right here is a petition, a letter, that an enslaved woman wrote to a member of an abolitionist society, or somebody wrote it for her, where she's asking him to intervene in her and her daughter's um, legal pursuits for freedom, right? So I think that that's illustrative of the intersections between these processes, where um, enslaved people's agencies, networks, initiatives, savings, uh, determination, right? All of that created and fostered alliances, broad cross-racial alliances that then set in motion a national movement uh, for abolition. Now, it's important to remember that this movement in Brazil, unlike in the U.S., unfolded nationally, like slavery existed nationally. Right, so this wasn't a place where the idea of mobilizing for something was abstract about an over there. You were mobilizing for something that you could have had an extended family member that owned people. You could have had neighbors. You could have people in your parish. You could have people in schools, right? I mean, so this was something that did kind of bring into play um, local uh, politics and, and, and tensions in, in, in a quite interesting and unique way um, that I think just merits highlighting here. And so I also have other examples of the ways these mobilizations crystallize in, in public co popular culture. Um, this gentleman here, Luis Gama, uh, if one were to make kind of broad historical comparisons, one can think of as a Frederick Douglass type in Brazil. He was illegally enslaved as a child, um, bought his freedom, and studied law and ended up representing hundreds of other people in the 1860s and 70s that had been brought to Brazil in the illegal slave trade and catalyzed um, all kinds of legal challenges and other sort of social associational networks. And, and here's another example of that, um, that relationship between slave agency and, and, an abo and societal mobilization. So this is what you can imagine. This is just a note on a business card, as you can see, that basically says, this person carrying the business card is fleeing from Y person, and I need you to help them, right? So it's important to kind of understand these kind of social dynamics of who was carrying these around, of the networks that they were creating, right? And when somebody shows up at your doorstep with something like this, sent by somebody else that you know, you are then forced to make a decision. Am I going to act or not, right? And so like, I think these are important elements to kind of take into account as to how this process unfolded and grew over the course of two decades. Oops. Um, 
one of the, the, the high moments of, of political intensity happened in the mid-1880s. And as I had mentioned, uh, the process of slavery and of abolition were both national. Um, and, and this province here in northern Brazil, called Ceará, was the first one to declare slavery abolished in its, in its area, right? So that was the first of 20 provinces. And, and the reasons behind that have its own stories that we can delve into later if you're interested. But what's nonetheless interesting is that as it became a haven, you had this maritime route for freedom that emerged in northeastern Brazil of somewhere between three and 5,000 people reach freedom by, by going there. And you also had you know, something that's kind of more equivalent to the U.S. version of the Underground Railroads unfold in southeastern Brazil, um, literally along the railroad tracks that connected the coffee fields where hundreds of thousands worked to uh, one of the port cities in southeastern Brazil, right? So this was somewhere in the mid 80s where these processes um, came together and had its kind of greatest political weight. And so what this case brought to the fore was the reality that you could abolish something. It also brought to the fore national state resistance to abolishing slavery because the only plan that the state wanted was something where it would dictate the terms to how it would end, not necessarily that it would continue on for a necessarily prolonged period of time, but how it would end and it would need to include some sort of compensation. This moment also galvanized wider sections of the population and I wanted to um, you know, highlight uh, teachers and, and their role and this women's abolitionist society. So like it was also intersecting with other questions about political rights, um, not voting per se, and we could talk about that later, but other sort of political rights um, that, that, that women put on the table that, um, that, that, that came about from this fight for slavery. And, and Leonor Porto, for example, was part of this abolitionist society in northeastern Brazil that helped people get to Ceará, right? And in the middle there, you have somebody that uh, was part of that, that militant abolitionist society that helped people flee. He himself had fought in the Paraguayan War 20 years earlier, right? So these connections between fighting in the war and being involved and the kind of radicalization that happened over 20 years are all kind of seen in, in this moment. Um, the story itself of, of how slavery ended is a, an important touchstone for these other more contemporary debates about the significance and the, the register to May 13th, right? Um, in part, it's because the, story, the slavery ended by a legal decree um, uh, sanctioned by, signed by, Princess Isabel, who, who, was, who was overseeing the country at that particular point. Um, and so, on the one hand, more what we would call conservative interpretations and renderings of abolition would, would depict her as the liberator, right? Um, minimizing, erasing, obfuscating all kinds of other important enslaved actions towards that process, right? Um, and and, and that, that was a fact insofar as that's how she was characterized, right, in, in that kind of representation afterwards to minimize any kind of revolutionary uh, impact of abolition. On the other hand, historically, at that moment in the late 1880s, she was seen by uh, enslaved people and free Afro-Brazilians as a tremendously important ally. Um, and that needs to be recognized as well. And what's important is that like after the abolition decree was passed, which incidentally had only two short clauses, one that it was immediate and one that it would have no compensation, within 18 months, the monarchy was overthrown in Brazil, right? The former landowners uh, revolted. They launched a Republican revolt and they overthrew the monarchy. That period, that that back and forth to try to overthrow the monarchy set in motion a black guard where popular sectors, Afro-Brazilian sectors, that saw in her and the royal family as important allies to kind of fight off 
this Republican push. So I think it's just important to kind of establish that as well as, as part of this moment in 1888, 1889. The last person I have here on the right, uh, Manuel Jumata Montero Lopez, is important because he was a politician that ran for office in the early 20th century, and he won an important election. Um, and what's significant was he waited like four days so he can take office on May 13th. Now, he's somebody that I um, researched because earlier in his life, he had been involved in the abolitionist movement as a law student. So here's another example of a free Afro-Brazilian law student, right? Elite of the elite that then runs for national, for, for office, wins. And then, so in his framework, May 13th was important as a date to take office, right? Again, this is important for us to kind of understand and have as a basis as we move forward into this thinking about May 13th in the late 20th and now early 21st century. In 1988, at the centennial, the Brazilian state decided to launch a massive public campaign to celebrate its own role in the bringing about abolition, to celebrate the fact that slavery and supposedly its problems had been left in the past. That ignited the broadest based black political movement that has happened in, in Brazilian history, right? And, and the centennial became a touchstone for very contentious public, um, black civil rights protests. And so one of the interesting things was that the political movement took aim was on this notion of why are we celebrating May 13th? Or we're not gonna, if we're gonna recognize it, we're not gonna recognize it in the way, in the, through the story that the state wants us to recognize it, right? And so that set in motion a fascinating uh, discussion where the black movement posited that rather than May 13th, Brazil should recognize November 20th, which is the date that commemorates the largest uh, maroon runaway slave community from, a from the 17th century, Zumbi of Palmares, right? And so the, the, the slide I have here is and, and they were successful. Uh, the movement was, and, and broader kind of public reaction. This was, oh shoot, this, sorry. This was President Lula, um, who is now running for presidents again, in 2003, 2004, laying a wreath at Zumbi's tomb, right? So that at, at the highest levels, this push worked, so to speak. And now, November 20th is, um, a state holiday in just about every state. Why it's not a federal holiday is, is, is a question I don't fully get, but it's a state holiday in virtually all the states. So it's recognized officially, right? Which interestingly then, it created some space again to return to May 13th and to rethink about it um, historically, and now it's very common in Brazilian universities, especially over the last 10 years, to hold events, public events like this, uh, relatively more academic events, so to speak, as well. And so I think both dates are part of a national consciousness. Um, and, and, and as part of that, there is also a recognition of important people that took part of this story. And I wanted to close with, uh, you know, the stamp that was reissued not too long ago of Maria Firmina dos Reis, who was uh, who authored uh, what is called Brazil's first anti-slavery novel, and it was published in 1859, right? So seven years after Uncle Tom's Cabin. And anyway, so it's an important pro way to reflect upon not just that we know more about what happened 150 years ago or so, but about the fact that we know more and recognize it differently based on political struggles and questions of today. So, thank you. All right, thank you all for a really rich discussion. Um, we do have a couple of questions queued up, so I wanna get to those. Um, I 
feel like there's any number of directions we could go, but um, there is a really interesting question that came in first, so I'll start with that one, which touches on something that I, I think you all at least glancingly touched on, but I think could, a lot more could be said about, which is about the impact of indigenous American forms of servitude on the histories of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. Um, I think probably each of you could comment on this uh, in your area on in some way when I want to talk about that, sort of the, the indigenous history of um, slavery and how it impacted how slavery developed in the Americas. Whoever wants to start. <laughs> oh, but that's why it's, it's interesting. The question is wonderful. I, I really appreciate it because I did, uh, as Seto just said, in my first book, uh, brought together the histories of indigenous people and of uh, the enslaved uh, people of, of African descent specifically. So I have not really dealt with indigenous slavery. That's why the question is not as simple in, in terms of, of, of uh, giving a full answer. But I think that what we do know is that uh, by separating these histories, we are also creating a, a false um, dichotomy, right? Because not only did these people live in, in you know, coexist uh, in, in, in all, across the Americas, uh, but also the way that freedom was itself shaped, so in this case, I'm talking not so much about slavery, but freedom, had to do with the understanding of the way that indigenous people had rights specifically in the Spanish-American context within this Spanish monarchy, right? So the indigenous people generally understood as free vassals became a model for the enslaved people who understood that being free had to do, has something to do with having rights and being engaged in a, in a political system, in that case, uh, the monarchy. And I'm talking here, of course, before uh, independence. I think that what happens in, during independence is very interesting as well because the, um, the leaders for independence immediately started to attack the institution that uh, construed indigenous people as separate, and I'm thinking here in ethnic terms, but also in fiscal terms, right, having different types of duties vis-a-vis -vis the state, and finally politically, right? The fact that they were considered to be themselves a separate group. Um, as we can imagine, I mean, we're thinking from the present point of view, this didn't really work. The fact of thinking about undoing indigeneity as a category was resisted, first of all, by indigenous people themselves uh, up to the present. And the way that I would link it, just to wrap up with the story of abolition, is that in part, due to the fact that racism really was marking uh, the, the process of abolition and the process of thinking about citizenship and the integration of people of African descent, even though that definitely had a, um, a layer that, that could potentially lead to their marginalization. I think that the, the people um, who were becoming free and themselves formed a group, a separate group, or a, a different social category, eventually also drew from the uh, understanding that indigenous people had of, the, of their own difference, right? A, a difference that I'll, I'll say again was not only fiscal, but also um, ethnic and political. And this connects, in fact, with, with Celso's last few free references to the present moment, because interestingly, it's both Brazil and Colombia, where groups, uh, I mean, in Colombia, they are actually called uh, rights to black communities, right? That's how they were legalized in the 1990s. They actually endorse the idea that blackness can be understood as a separate ethnicity. But in this case, an ethnicity that is positively uh, awarding black people rights, for example, to territory, which is, of course, a uh, a right that indigenous people also had. So I think that, you know, there's a very rich conversation on the ground happening among these, these different uh, groups of people, but that historians are increasingly more interested in uh, in the present moment. <laughs> 
Yes, thank you. Um, as was characterized, it's important to understand kind of the ways that these different bonded or forced uh, labor systems uh, and practices coexisted more than not, even though if legally uh, indigenous servitude in Brazil would have been abolished uh, in the earlier part of the 19th century, earlier to mid part of the 19th century, um, the relationship between uh, African uh, enslavement and the extension of slavery and slave-like systems was uh, in certain parts of Brazil, in the Northeast and in the Northern part of Brazil, um, very much connected to experiences and, and, and practices forged with and across uh, with indigenous communities. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, just for right now, I'll just kind of be brief on that matter. Journal, anything you want to add or? I, I guess I just a, a brief add, and that would be when I'm thinking about um, indigenous forms of bondage uh, and also African forms of bondage, uh, in many cases, these are relationships of, of violence and uh, people can um, kind of own other people, but the, the moral and ethical premises are also very different. Uh, so people can be owned, but they can be reincorporated into, into various indigenous societies here, or if we're talking about the West Coast of Africa, um, they can be taken back in. So, so certainly it's the case that across various societies in the Atlantic world, you have uh, these uh, various spectrums of political power in which pe some people are on the bottom and some people are on the top. And I agree with all the comments in terms of understanding how those systems relate. And so I guess the, the point that I want to make is to never lose sight of the fact that, that they are different. Um, even though they are impacting each other. Great, thank you all. Um, another question that's come in that I um, am going to try to interpret a little bit here. I, I think the question, the question is basically, did the Spanish American fighters for independence blame Spain for the existence of slavery in their territories in more or less the same way that the US revolutionaries, the patriots, blamed England for the existence of slavery on its soil? Or was, was this entirely understood differently? Oh, that's another wonderful question. Thank you, because it is something that I, I kind of had planned to emphasize and I, I didn't, so it allows me to expand on, on, on my remarks. I think that that was a really important part of the strategy of abolishing slavery, and it had to do with rejecting Spain, rejecting it you know, as a colonial power. And as we know, actually, I didn't mention it as well, Cuba is going to remain uh, linked to the Spanish empire, and interestingly, it is going to, at that very same moment, increase its own dependence on slavery, right? So we see, again, that link between colonialism and slavery as it grows in the, in the Spanish Caribbean and in the mainland, the strategy of some of these independence advocates is to turn their backs in, uh, on Spain and obviously attack the institution of slavery as a, as a Spanish legacy. Now, that's obviously more of a symbolic gesture because in practice, many people, as I mentioned, in the, in the continent are going to remain very invested in slavery, not only as an economic institution, but also in, in, in the, to the extent that it granted them social status and that it allowed them to continue to hold on to this very prized uh, form of property. And so ultimately, that's a, a very ambivalent uh, rejection. Uh, but, but that allows us to think about something that, that I, I also want to just to close say, which is the very interesting uh, contrast between the Spanish American Republic's commit commitment to anti-slavery, which was open, 
which was done through the constitutional texts themselves, in contrast to what happened, of course, in the United States, right? So we start to see different models of republicanism that are taking shape. Of course, the Haitian Republic is one example, much more radical. The Spanish American uh, republics are another one. And the United States obviously clashes both with the Spanish American republics, anti-slavery, as much as with the Haitian uh, one. Uh, so yes, the, the, do you want to say something too to this? Super brief comment that there's wonderful borderlands work going on that uh, looks at uh, people who are, you know, bringing enslaved people with them to Texas, and then those people um, are moving to Mexico. Uh, so a lot of work has been done on a kind of underground railroad um, in North America from the southern states to the northern states. Um, but there's really exciting work that's being done that's looking at um, enslaved people who are looking at Mexico um, as, as, a, as a space of, of freedom and a space that, that would offer freedom defined in various ways coming out of a different kind of international um, conversation about rights and national identity. Thank you. Um, last but not least, uh, the we are on the eve of the 13th of May here, so it seems appropriate to ask about um, commemorations and commemorations throughout the hemisphere of dates of emancipation, dates of the end of legal slavery in one contested way or another. Um, I, I wonder um, if, if you all would like to comment on how that's developed in your various areas of study, how these have been commemorated over time. There's been a lot of movement in the US recently with Juneteenth being adopted as, as, a, as a holiday. Um, any, any comments from each of you about the, the commemorations that have taken place of the end of slavery or of emancipation? Whoever wants to start. <laughs> I think that one of the interesting points about May 13th in Brazilian history is that you'd be hard pressed to cross any city, midsize and bigger, and not come across a street, school, public square, something that doesn't signal that moment, right? And so to a large extent, it's ingrained in an elementary and to some extent secondary school curriculum. Now granted, when I talk to relatives that may be a little bit older, you may forget and whatnot, but, but it is part of something that like you have to in, engage directly, right? And, and it's just a date. And like I said, the date is gonna mean different things at different times in history and it's political registers and whatnot. But I, I do think that that is one of the kind of interesting aspects of thinking about this question of emancipation, of thinking about um, r racial justice in, in a Brazilian context now. And um, it, it's, it's hard to kind of put my finger. I mean, as I was saying towards the end, it, it, it seems to be... It seems that now both dates, the November 20th, I mean, November 20th is what it is. I mean, it's a state, it's largely a state holiday and, and a day of recognition and commemoration and everybody from the president to, to everybody, right, is is recognizing that, right? And, and, and the affirmation is certainly important, um, but then if everybody affirms it in a particular way, then who gets to define the agenda for the reflections becomes... Also an important, you know, that, that question of, is it being um, diluted of its uh, more radical potential, right? I mean, that, that's on the table. But, but May 13th, I think, is, remains an important opportunity. Uh, and increasingly, as I was saying, like in academic spaces as well, for reflecting upon these questions. And to reflect upon these questions in, in also a comparative sense, as, as this happens here, right? I mean, I think that, um, and, and just off the top of my head, some of the best events in Brazil in the last 10, 15 years have been uh, thinking about, you know, whether it's the U.S., a little bit of a lesser extent, and it should be done a lot more vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Spanish America and the Caribbean, right? Um, so let me say that. <laughs> 
I think I would, in terms of piggybacking off of that, I would say that in thinking about America and then from what I know about uh, Brazil and Central America, there are these debates about the degree to which the enslaved either are kept out of these new national entities or the degree to which they're kind of allowed to participate. And both of those positions don't do enough to look at what the formerly enslaved people themselves do. And so all sorts of dates in kind of North America arise, right? 1776, 1807, 1863. And one of the things that fascinates me is the way in which uh, people of African descent take those dates themselves and make their own arguments about belonging, about rights, and about citizenship. They don't leave these dates to anybody else. So just to kind of highlight uh, Celso's point, these, these, these dates are always contested um, in, in dramatic fashion uh, because people attach so much meaning to them. Um, I'll just say quickly, and if you remember the table that, that I presented, how many dates we, we have uh, opportunities for, for commemorating or celebrating or even debating or even documenting, right? I think we're in the process of doing that. I, I mentioned the 1810s as one moment when these processes began in, in Spanish America. 1820s, another very important moment because that's when independence is finalized and these constitutions are finally written, most of them having those... Uh, uh, constitutional manumission laws, but then we're going to go all the way up to the 50s, I think, and hopefully there will be more insistence on making this a subject of public debate. I honestly would say that um, there's the danger on one hand of it becoming fractured by nations, which is, of course, natural in some way, but uh, as we emphasized with this panel, the whole point here is to think about broader processes that are bringing people together in conversation, uh, obviously the, the, the social movements themselves. And so it's, it's something that I think we, we will hopefully be seeing more in, in not just the, the, the national bounded settings, but in, in creating larger uh, conversations across, of course, uh, the Americas as well. Okay, well, we are out of time. So um, please join me in thanking our panelists uh, for being here tonight. <laughs>